thank you very much for coming to the City Library tonight. Uh, my name is Jane Laws. I am the Community Development Officer for Adelaide City Council. We're very excited to have this event on tonight and have this fantastic panel with us. We run many Go Green initiatives throughout the city and you'll see at the end of each aisle we've actually got a clipboard with information for people to put their name, contact details down. So if you would like to be involved in future events that we hold or activities and workshops, or if you're interested in running something in the city, please leave your contact details for us and we will follow it up with you. In the meantime, I'd like to introduce Ed Wilby to you and he will introduce our wonderful panel tonight. Enjoy, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Jane. Um, as uh, Jane was saying, like tonight, we're basically having a panel discussion. I don't know if hopefully people have experienced these discussions before. Uh, is this exchange ideas between passionate people who we have in front, um, and hopefully the audience? And obviously, being here, I'm assuming you're you're passionate people as well <laughs> in terms of uh, the topic that we're looking at. And it's, uh, from my perspective, looking at how intentional communities can aid in developing uh, sustainable cities. And we may have a series of discussions, depending on feedback that we get and other things, to help aware, to, to raise awareness of the importance of intentional communities and the role they can play in the development of our cities. And, and, and hopefully, uh, through the discussion, um, I. I'm, I'm, I, I hope that people will take away something from this uh, tonight, and if not, um, ask the questions needed <laughs> of the panelists so that you do. Um, anyway, like, I want to thank you all for, for coming, and, and as uh, Jane was saying, I'm, I'm Ed Wilby. I'm a co-founder of an organization called Intentional Communities Australia Alliance. And our aim is to explore more harmonious ways to satisfy human needs through achieving a balance between the physical, spiritual, and the environment. And through this, we, we hope to, uh, to be achieved by helping to create and support existing in intentional communities who have established a common vision and values to build environments which provide for our basic needs, which include food, shelter, um, and, and so forth. And, sh and basically uh, share resources in a way that enhances the health and well-being of not only the community but the natural environment and, and, through, the, uh, and through an optimized work-life balance. I would like to start again by acknowledging that we are meeting on traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains and I'd like to pay respects to the elders of past and present and we recognize and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationship with the land. We acknowledge that these el elders of continuing importance to the Ghana people living today. And would also like to acknowledge that these elders and, and those who may be present today are caretakers of this land to the future. And so as an organization, we would like to encourage all of us to consider that we are also stewards of this land and treat it accordingly. And also, I'll, I'll do this now, I'd like to give thanks to the library for their support in setting up and providing the venue and funding for the recording that's going on here, which will be part of a podcast and, and videoing. And this information will be made available through Facebook sites and, uh, and through the library and through our own. Also, again, I want to thank the panelists for taking the time um, and, and basically just share their passion and experience and the audience for, the, for your time and coming here, uh, assuming that you're seeking opportunities to express your views and find out more. And also to my uh, uh, co-founder, Leo Abello Road, who's uh, also the co-founder of the Intentional Community Australia Alliance, who pursued and followed up on this, this opportunity for a panel discussion so we can explore this topic further. So tonight's discussion is about sustainable cities through intentional communities. And hopefully we, we may have, like I said, future discussions on how we can create a preferred future through intentional communities in alliance with like-minded organizations and communities. And the question highlights the possibility that by encouraging new and, um, and empowering 
existing intentional communities that together they can play an important role in the development of sustainable cities. And just give a bit of brief on Intentional Community Australia Alliance. Our objectives is based on the intentional, on an international framework linked to the Fellowship of Intentional Communities in the US. And so a key phrase associated with our, our group is to co-create a preferred future with all like-minded stakeholders and in a sense of what does this mean to create a preferred future. And uh, like with the uh, Australia Alliance, we have a vision. And, and part of this vision, I don't know if you guys can see the picture behind me, it was uh, drawn up by uh, a visionary and architect called Paul Downton. And, and this preferred future is, is uh, or similar alternatives, we believe can only come about through the involvement of intentional communities who have a common vision and values. It's about creating a preferred future that reflects the hearts, minds, and actions of individuals, families, and communities who wish to come together and develop a common vision that is underpinned by these common values. And that will enable the creation of a lifestyle, not only enables or reflect the enhancement of the health and well-being of the people, but also of the natural environment. And we believe through this model, it will enable all creation to thrive and prosper to reach our fullest potential. So, and again, this lifestyle is nurtured based on caring, respect, cooperation to satisfy our basic needs, taking responsibility, and achieving, achieving one's fullest potential together to satisfy all of our needs. Now, also this preferred future is created through a culture shift in the way humans think and that through the intent of achieving balance and harmony um, and in terms of satisfying human needs and the built environment and the natural environment and, and through this to enhance our lifestyles in a manner that, that we live in balance with all of creation. The, um, so in a sense, our organization is about supporting the, the development of, of these intentional communities and and also to uh, uh, hopefully uh, provide initiatives that will develop uh, successful, sustainable cities. And there's a number of examples. The, the slides I'll just go through fairly quickly. Um, a part of the discussions is about an intention community. What is it? And it's uh, designed to start to have a high high degree of uh, social cohesion and teamwork. And these pictures are of existing uh, intentional communities. And, uh, and through our organization, we hope to share what works and what doesn't work and uh, that's associated with these successful intentional communities around the world. And in sustainable cities, again, it's associated with a built environment inhabited by people and that it can be sustained over many generations. And so uh, I'm just going to flip through these. Uh, hopefully through the talk you may, maybe get a better understanding that we have intentional communities within our city already. And, uh, and there's other initiatives that's been happening. I might, Finn Hohn, Crystal, Crystal Waters, internationally, the Odinger Arts community, the indigenous communities. Um, there's initiatives looking at uh, uh, developing housing and, and that that are uh, zero carbon. Um, we have the natural environment, which are also part of this whole, whole uh, holistic living, and greenhouses, Denmark co-housing, tiny houses, earth ships, and, and the like. Look, uh, I just want to introduce the, the panelists that we have. Um, this to my left is uh, Josie McLean. And she's the principal of the partnership, an Australian consultancy dedicated to a sustainable world that works for all. And the partnership is aiming to, con uh, to contribute to facilitating this profound change within organizations that nurtures people, communities, and a natural environment. Uh, we have apologies from Stephen Poole, who couldn't make it uh, here tonight, who's a permaculturalist and an uh, ecological landscape consultant. 
Next to Josie is Brett Aylin, who's an architect with TS4, who has a clear vision of what it takes to deliver sustainable projects. He's been working in the industry for over 20 years, and his broad ex experience enriches his understanding of sustainability at all levels. And recently, he's a part of the team that developed the award-winning Zero Carbon House. Ken Long, who's uh, next, is passionate about creating built environments which provide a rich and healthy life for its inhabitants and help support a healthy coexistence with ecological and cultural context. Uh, Ken is also an ESD consultant with D Squared Consulting. He's an ambassador for the International Living Future Institute and the chairman of the Adelaide Sustainable Building Network, which is a small, locally based nonprofit business group. And, uh, and Phil, <laughs> who's, who's on the end there, is the founder and director of Sustain SA, and is currently the uh, role as the project leader for the Adelaide Living Library uh, for CRC and the Low Carbon Living, previous director of sustainability at, at Renewal SA, and, uh, and also worked on sustainability frameworks for Bowdoin and the Tonsley projects. It's also the president of the Australian Institute of Urban Studies. So, with that introduction, uh, I'd like to kick off the discussion um, by asking the panelists a few questions. Each, and the main reason is to set, uh, of these set questions is to enable the panelists to help warm up uh, to the dialogue and to be able to answer questions from the, from the audience. So, I'd like to start off with Brett Aylin. As part of it is that we want to understand how intentional communities can effectively participate in the development of sustainable cities. And uh, Brett has some direct experience in developing um, a sort of Christy Walk ecological city or, or village, and there's some lessons learned from that. So the first question, Brett, are there any local examples of intentional communities or green neighborhoods that you know of that, um, that you could share with us? Sure, I've, um, I've been involved with a number of Adelaide communities uh, over the years, uh, including Christie Walk, which is on Sturt Street. Christie Walk is, um, is a yeah, the housing development that was part of the vision of Paul Downton, and um, that's actually where I met Ed. So I was part of the, the team, not so much the planning team um, for that project, but I was involved in construction management of that project and you know, helping it be realised. So that was the first one that I was really actively involved with. And then um, while I was at Energy Architecture, I had some involvement with the Ordinga Arts Eco Village and also with um, the Beyond Today development down um, near Port Elliot. Now those are both uh, fairly large scale residential developments. And what's unique about those developments is um, they have a, their, their own set of design guidelines. So. Of course, they have to comply with all of the council guidelines, um, but on top of that, they've got their own bylaws and guidelines which are very much aligned with um, ecological principles. So that's what really makes those communities unique. And I've worked on those in various ways at, at planning level and um, designing houses. And then um, there's, I'm also aware of the Willunga Garden Village, which is a small example um, of an intentional community where some people bought up some land and built a, a series of houses around a commons. So that's a very nice um, local example of an intentional community. And then more recently there's um, Lock Hill Park and I was again involved uh, at the beginning of, of that project, um, master planning level, and that was a government, SA government initiative and energy architecture was involved at the, the master planning stages. And then there was the um, Zero Carbon House, uh, which was up on the screen briefly, which I was also involved with. So, and that was actually the development of an individual project. So yeah, there's, there's quite a lot of local examples, um, and I was involved with several of them. Okay. Thanks for that, Brad. And w with these local examples, there's often a, a framework which uh, needs to tie in with a, a number of uh, principles associated with developing the built environment that can also link in with, with the uh, a, a sort of the community who'd be living in these. And Ken, um, Ken Long has direct experience in, in looking at these um, sort of frameworks and principles. So 
So the question to you, Ken, is what are the principles and frameworks which people could utilize to guide the creation, say, of intentional communities? Yes, yeah, so um, as Ed was talking about, when you want to approach any project of sustainable buildings, sustainable built environments, especially as an intentional community, you have to have a guiding vision to help you go through the whole process because any kind of community, it's not something that gets developed in three months and then gets put down and then is wham bam, thank you ma'am. It's actually a, pro a process that gets, almost gets evolved over a long time. It takes a really long time to get it from start to finish as well. So that's why it's extremely important to have a certain kind of vision um, to put toward uh, whatever project, um, sustainable community or intentional community that any of us would like to kind of push forward into the future. Um, now, that's where principles really come into um, their work, essentially. If you have good principles to lay down your vision, then at least those principles will stay grounded. And any time during the process or the journey, you can go back to those principles to be able to say, are whatever we're designing right here or any kind of governance that we're putting into, are they feeding back into these principles that we want? Um, and especially when you're going toward sustainable outcomes, there's different principles come into play, whether it comes into energy, principles around water, principles around how to interact with each other. So in terms of the international sphere and relating directly to the built environment, there's a lot of principles that you can really use, but some of the things that I would encourage people to look at is really looking at holistic design principles or um, holistic frameworks that not only take into consideration environmental impact, so that's a lot of stuff that you can measure, such as energy, water, waste. That's a lot of things that we call uh, quantitative outcomes. Now those are very important to show that you're a green community, um, if you'd say. Um, but at the other end of the spectrum, we're also a culture, we're also a people. So you have to make sure that these quantitative outcomes, which is known as more getting these environmental outcomes, you also have to have the social outcomes as well. So if we're looking at many more holistic <laughs> principles, um, uh, does anyone here know about permaculture? So permaculture has a lot of guiding principles within there that can really help. Um, and that has really helped a lot of communities go toward a sustainable future. Um, we, we've already had two people talk about uh, Paul Downton, but within his theories, he also developed the eco, eco city or ecopolis um, principles, um, which are really directly related to the built environment to have all these different principles around that can help any group of people to say, how do we start to shape? Where do we want to go? How do we want to shape as a group? And and um, how we go forward from there. But principles by themselves sometimes can fall apart because they don't really have any backing toward it. So that's where really frameworks come into play because they have a outlining methodology that can really help you go, go through the process. And a lot of these frameworks were developed by people or projects that have really done it before. So I'd really encourage a lot of people to look at these, also these frameworks that can help guide these visions. Um, one of the grandfathers of them all are uh, from Christopher Alexander called the Patent Language. Um, if anyone get, wants to get into there where there is a lot of, there's a big framework around all these different principles that create good design and also social cohesion and also environmental impact. Um, nowadays there's lots of frameworks such as uh, Green Star Communities, if anyone wants to go down that realm. One Planet Living, which is very much also about governance. So that can help um, the social cohesion and also the built environment. And uh, one of the ones that I'm a big advocate for is uh, the, living, uh, the living future. So that encompasses the living communities challenge, which is really about encompassing all those quantitative and qualitative aspects and really holding people to the T. So it's also become a third party certification where if any internet, uh, intentional community wanted to say, we're doing what we set to do, that becomes a measuring uh, stick that you can actually go for. Um, so that's where I see, in terms of helping a lot of people, is that if you can l 
actually look at other projects that have done it before and also um, different frameworks that are out there, then that can really help guide the conversation not only for something that you want to do, but if you're involved in e even a higher level of government that you can put these on the table with people that are pushing projects forward. Ken, thank you very much. I think you hit a, a few spots there. The, the, the built environment, getting that in balance with satisfying human needs, I think they go hand in hand. And as Ken was talking about the cultural side, um, I'd, I'd like to ask the question of, of Josie, is uh, in terms of how important is a sustainable community and culture in developing a sustainable city from your perspective? Oh, very. Will that do? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to focus my response on a couple of... Thank you. Um, on, on two points, really. First of all, what we mean by sustainable. And uh, there may be howls of angst when I say that. I hope you don't end up in that position, though. And secondly, the interdependence between culture, community and sustainability. Um, and I want to start by asking, well, what do we even mean by this word sustainable? Um, I've heard it used a lot this evening, and there's a great assumption that we actually know what that means. Um, and I was watching a presentation by Peter Senge. I don't know if anyone's familiar with him. Um, one of the founders of, um, well, one of the great pop populists of uh, systems thinking, if you like. Um, but he was um, giving this presentation and talking about how um, there's this huge relationship between the language we use and the way we actually see the world. And he was relating this story, and I can't remember which particular um, American Indian tribe he was talking about, but he was relating a story about an American Indian tribe that actually has no nouns in its vocabulary, in its language. No nouns. Think about that. Our English language is full of nouns. We have words like change, leadership, and sustainable that we concretize. We make them concrete by making them nouns. But if you touch to change, a leadership, or a sustainable recently, I mean, these are just concepts, actually. And this tribe that Peter was talking about only has words for dynamics and processes. And I think that's an incredible way of thinking about sustainable. Um, what if we only had language that was about dynamics and processes? What would that mean for the way we think about this term sustainable and sustainability? I, th I think it would change it significantly because it would have us focus on sustainability as actually being an evolving state. Um, not a destination that we're somehow going to get to at some point in time, not an end point that we need to argue about, actually, more an evolving dynamic between a number of different variables, how many people we've got, how much water we've got, how much food we've got, how quickly the population's growing, what's the social divide between people, who's got what, who's not got what. Um, all of this is interconnected. So when I use the word sustainable, I don't even like the word sustainable, actually. I like the word sustaining. Um, because first of all, it's something we can do. It's an action. It's sustaining. And I think it's about recognising the interconnectedness between things, the interdependence between things. These are often invisible to us on one level, but that it's highly important, the relationship between things is what we're looking at when we're talking about sustainability. So I, I think sustaining is what we might be thinking about and nurturing people and nurturing the natural environment might be what we're trying to do. And that this is not an end game, this is actually an evolving state. And we're never gonna get to an end game, so let's forget it. <laughs> um, it does keep going and, and so, you know, and it will keep evolving as Earth keeps changing. Um, so I think thinking about that, that may actually reduce a lot of conflict as we go forward as well. Because instead of having to agree on the end game, we can actually just agree on what's important, the principles perhaps, in, in getting to, towards, closer towards a sustaining state. And um, I've tried to use this 
small example to start with as an example of how our culture actually influences sustainability. So our language is a part of our culture and perhaps you can see, it may be a bit convoluted, I hope not, but perhaps you can see even the way we use our language actually influences this issue of sustainability. So the other way, the other thing about culture is to recognise that it might be um, a bit like the dreadful iceberg metaphor again. Um, you've probably been overpowered by icebergs in your life. Um, but, but culture has a tangible bit that we can see, a visible bit. And it's like the top of the iceberg, if you like. And yet the bottom of the iceberg is invisible to us. So the attitudes, beliefs, values, um, are things, the stories that we tell each other, are the things that are underneath our culture that actually drive the tangible things that we see as the artefacts of our culture. And we might think about our, our built environment as a tangible reflection of the invisible things at the bottom of the iceberg that are actually driving or or another way of expressing it might be that actually the built form, the structural form, is an emergent property of the culture underneath it. The values, the beliefs that we have about the, world, the way the world works and the things that are most important to us. So if you think about Manhattan's skyline, is it actually an expression of how people really want to live? Or is it an expression of a financial model? And I'd su suggest that it's actually an expression of a financial model, an expression of how do we get the most value out of this plot of land? Um, and, and what we're valuing there is actually the economics of the situation. And I'd suggest that to become sustainable, we need to reappraise, reprioritise those values and actually think about the way we're seeing the world and the way it's operating. And that's the importance of culture. And you're going to wind me up. No, I'm not. I, I love what you're saying. <laughs> I don't want to wind you up. But, uh, but, I, but I'd like to, uh, I think it's a good time maybe to, okay. to, to look at the, the next question, which I'm hoping builds on to what, what you're suggesting. And, and um, like, like this, uh, Ken talked about the framework um, and Brett sort of uh, examples of what's happening here. But it, this, this government have a, a role to play as well as, um, as the community itself. And that's one of the questions I want to ask uh, Phil, in terms of what role does government and research play in leading us towards a, uh, a say, a low carbon built form of built environment that involves intentional communities that I think touches on maybe what uh, Josie is suggesting that the cultural side is something which uh, we haven't really looked at in depth yet. Thanks, Ed, and uh, thanks to all the other panellists. I, I agree um, uh, a lot with, with what everything has been said. Uh, revolution, evolution, conversation and culture. Um, government has a role to play in all of those. Um, we set opportunities to set regulation and legislation to actually set the parameters of how we do things. But it can actually happen on a number of levels. So federal government has a role, and, and you can see the, the differences between what was set a couple of years ago and where the federal government is now setting in terms of some of the policy positions um, which are starting to create waves overseas in terms of whether Australia is actually pulling its weight in relationship to the carbon debate. If you look at South Australia, the government has a role to play as well uh, in terms of... Can people hear me? Just checking. Sorry. Um, in, in terms of uh, local government has a role to play as well in terms of leadership. So you would have seen a recent thing that came out from the state government and obviously with uh, Adelaide City Council support in terms of a carbon neutral Adelaide. But what does that really mean? And if you actually looked at carbon neutral Adelaide, it's only going to hit potentially 45,000 people that live within the city boundary and it may affect other people that live outside that. So um, we need to, to be really clear about what is government trying to achieve in the way that it does things. If we go back to the issue of intentional communities, so the ability to set frameworks. We set a framework at Lock Hill Park, but we also set performance boundaries around that. So in order to, to look at Lock Hill Park, Lock Hill Park was a research and development project. It, it was something that tried to create leadership way beyond the norm. So from a four-star house in, uh, in 2004, it started to set a 7.5-star house. And I know there are people here from Lock Hill Park as well that are living there. They're living in an intentional community that was 
the, the framework was set by the government, the performance uh, parameters were set by the government. We set up the Zero Carbon House Challenge. What we wanted to do was to put out a sense of leadership. But what government hasn't done is actually look at that and say, how do we do this right across the board? So, you know, having worked in Renewal SA and, and previously LMC, and if I look at some of the developments that have happened, so they've, they've stepped up with Bowdoin and they've said, initially, talking about frameworks, it was based on a one planet living principles, right? in terms of how that was developed, you know, zero carbon, zero waste, etc. Uh, it then went into a process of saying, well, how do we do this economically? It has to be a commercial entity. So the idea of an intentional community set around that and then developed accordingly. So in terms of, uh, in terms of that, they actually then said, well, well, let's make every building five star, a five star building, right? five star green star building, and then let's put a five star green star community framework to test whether we're actually making that. Now, if you go back to a framework in, intentionally, you would say, well, how, what, how has the community owned that? It's owned it in some ways in that it's had input, but it actually hasn't owned it in terms of how it has actually been finalised in terms of development. One of the things that they did at Lockyer Park, and, and I'll admit, I was, I was there. Uh, the first thing went, sorry, at Bowdoin, and I was there and when it was first announced, the first thing I said is, this is a great opportunity to make this a car-free zone, right? That was, you know, and that was, uh, and that was done very early. And the, the comment that I got back from the executive was pretty much, uh, that won't be commercial, right? We need, to have, we need to have apartments with car parks, all right? So an intention around zero carbon uh, development, uh, you know, an opportunity to really lift the bar and take the development industry with us. You know, we lost an opportunity, but I must admit, they did actually get council to go down to 0.75 car parks per house um, within that development. So sometimes it's incremental, the steps that we take. But, and um, this is sort of living inside the tent, but you can also go down there and you, and you can see that one of the apartments that's gone up there has convinced them that the issue is, it's a commercial issue, and they now have two, two car parks per apartment. So. Now, government has a role to actually put a line in the sand and actually stick to that line in the sand. And I think the other part of this is we actually have to take some of the evidence. And the evidence of research is that Lock Hill Park is performing. Lock Hill Park had a, had a standard of 66% reduction in energy from a 2004 baseline. It's actually performing at that. So therefore, if it's performing at that, why aren't we, in a place like Playford, which has, is the big, one of the biggest urban renewal projects in Australia, over the next 10 to 15 years, why aren't we starting to implement this as an opportunity? Have we asked the community what they want? We've asked the market. We have asked the market. The market says, I need an affordable house and I need it at this level, but have we asked the community, what are the other things that you want government to achieve? And if I take zero carbon house as an example, if we ramped up zero carbon house and suddenly, sorry, Brett, we'll put it into the IKEA model, right, where you actually are able to then produce those houses en masse, the price comes down. As a result, not only do I have an affordable house, I have a low carbon house, <laughs> and I have something that, is, that, that actually is a no regrets policy because those houses will be thermally comfortable, we'll be able to, go, you know, be able to live within those houses, health and wellbeing will be um, improved as a result of what we're doing. The other role in terms of government is to actually, and I'm currently involved in a national energy efficiency building project with the, with the Commonwealth and we're actually looking at auditing of uh, energy efficiency of houses in terms of meeting the performance stars of the rating. And what we're finding is that you can plan a house to be five star or six star or seven star, but in terms of signing off on that as a planning design um, process, are they going to perform like that? So there's a point where government has a role to make sure that in the market, you are getting what you pay for. If you want a five or six or seven star house, you have to make sure that when you buy it and you get the keys, you're actually getting the performance of that. So government's role in research is to make sure that the evidence exists to be able to improve the standards, to improve the compliance. Also, government has a role to play in leadership. So, so things like frameworks, and this, if we talk about councils, now there is things like one planet living councils, and I need to finish 
so I've talked too long, but that's okay. But you can talk about frameworks that exist for councils, for buildings, um, and also for communities. But the vision is about you know how do how do people get engaged to actually form that? And everyone in this room has the opportunity to drive your councils, drive your developers, drive your drive the business of government to get those frameworks adopted as a matter of course rather than a niche. Well, Phil, you actually, uh, no, 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 you, you did really well because that was part of the next question in, in terms of, uh, which I'd like to you know, see if I can get Brett to comment on, is like who, who needs to push, advocate for green buildings and neighborhoods? And, and as um, um, Phil was talking about a role of government, uh, not only is it government, possibly industry, uh, design profession or citizens, and I'd like to, your views on that, Brett, please. Yeah, well, I'd say it's, it's definitely all of the above. Um, you know, government has a very important role to play. Um, you know, government can, can set these large-scale uh, frameworks, which are really very important in order to achieve these kind of developments at a large scale. But then it has to go right down through the line, and I think collaboration um, is a real key here. So you need to have government uh, collaborating with developers, and you need to have developers collaborating with the people that are buying the land and the blocks and the houses. So you really need to have this um, communication, this strong level of communication across all of those. And then you have the designers that are responding to that and to the individual sites. And the t so across the board, there really needs to be that um, collaboration. So I think frameworks that help set up those methods of communication are very important. Um, I think the, the zero carbon house, um, I'll come back to it because it was a nice little micro study in collaboration. Um, the government set it up as a competition, but the framework of the competition was, was collaboration. So uh, often what happens is the, the, the developers are there, people buy the land, they then engage a designer, say, or a builder, and all of these people are um, playing on their own team, in a sense. Mm. Whereas the Zero Carbon House was an experiment in collaboration where all the players came together on a team. So we had the architects, we had the engineers, we had the sustainability consultants, we had government and their framework, um, we had a builder, we had a student, Ken was actually the student on, on our team <laughs> at the time. And look, it, and the collaboration was, was unique. Um, I've never experienced a project like that before. And we didn't have a client as such because we, we didn't have a buyer at that point. But we had a real estate agent who, who represented the client in a sense. And um, that was an interesting part of the picture as well because it meant that we could actually you know, have that market feedback um, direct from the real estate agent. And then eventually we did get a buyer and we then collaborated with her on some of the fine detail. So I think that is a really good example of collaboration. Um, and the result speaks for itself. Well, Brett, I think that's bringing up, for me, a, a, a very good point in, in terms of uh, not only the role of government and the examples that we have, that maybe the lessons we can learn. So I, I'd like to just go to the next question, if I can, and maybe we can elaborate on I'd like to ask the panelists, in a sense, what they feel is the next step toward developing sustainable cities. Have we got the evidence now to, to demonstrate that we know what to do and how can communities be more effectively involved? So I'd like to put that question to the panelists. <laughs> um, I think uh, the, the experience of Lockheed Park, we, we actually had a monitoring program for Lockheed Park for nine years. You know, that's quite unique. In health, we monitor programs sometimes over 20 years. When we do an urban development project, which is where we live, which is our community, we don't monitor. We don't monitor the performance of that community or help it to evolve over time. So I think it's a really important thing that we start to think about the research. So the evidence is starting to come. The Low Carbon Living CRC is starting to produce evidence and frameworks to say, yes, we should be able to do this and it can be cost effective. But we actually haven't got that research, and I was talking to to someone in this room today about the research in a way that translates to everyone so that everyone can have the same information. And it's the translation of research that's critical. So I think the evidence is there. 
I think it's the translation so that everyone gets a message is not. And with, with that sort of uh, evidence and that, it, it's, does someone else in the panel have a feeling like in terms of the next step, is it, is it fairly clear that we, how we get the community involved or and in terms of producing these cities and in terms of the role of government, is there other sort of evidence out there on that? I honestly think there's multiple levels to the whole thing. So um, excuse us for talking a lot of very big picture with all of you, all of you guys because um, intentional communities can be someone uh, setting up a multi-generational house, uh, so to speak. Um, it can be about two families wanting to buy one block and creating a co-housing option. Um, it could be about people buying two blocks and setting up a whole bunch of tiny houses. Um, so it doesn't have to stand at a very, um, mac like very macro scale. It can actually come down a little bit. But it really has to, uh, I guess for myself, if you're, if you're talking about how do we do it now, that's still trying to speed up the process. Um, so when Josie's talking about language and things like that, one thing that we really have to consider is that, once again, this is a process. So if you, if you personally would like to undergo this process, whether it's on a micro or a macro scale, how do we get the proper language on board, uh, whether it is through um, sustainable living, sustainable buildings, um, all those kind of go hand in hand because they're interdependent on how we as a people start to uh, coordinate with each other, coordinate with our values, coordinate with our lives to be able to have a very good outcome. And of course, the built environment also reflects that. So uh, it's not to, we all, we all know that um, this word sustainability is something that's very attainable at the moment. But what a lot of people don't say is that it actually requires other people. So in terms of a, intentional communities, you can make a sustainable house on your own, but what, what's the ripple effect of that? The ripple effect is a lot bigger when you get a lot more people involved, and that takes a process. That takes the ability to communicate, and that's all of us involved. So whether you're involved at different stages like ourselves, or you're someone studying at uni, or you're a parent, it's all about being able to understand that if I want to go through this process, I need to understand how to navigate through it and communicate with people on a level that they're gonna be able to share this same vision. So. That's how I kind of see all of it. Thank you. That was great. And I, I want to build on that with another step from my own perspective. And so it's the, the community perspective that I think is missing. When we build houses for one person and one block of land, we're not talking about relationships. We're talking about people on one, in one house on one block of land. So I, I think it's actually about developing connections with each other. And I don't think we have to all have the same vision. Although um, the types of visioning that we do in organisations to help them become sustaining <coughs> organisations are actually visions of how we want to experience work and life. They're a different type of vision, they're not a tangible vision. And um, it seems a bit odd in our tangible sort of world that we should give importance to something that's intangible. But um, if you can actually, number one, create some space in your own life so you can stop and think and ask yourself the question, what do I really want? How do I really want to live my life? I think that would be a great first step. If you could, number two, ask that question and talk with other people about it, and number three, start to generate a story that responds to those questions for you, we will develop little subcultures that will value slightly different things, but fundamentally the same things, because my own research shows this, and um, I've been doing academic research around this for the last 10 years as well, um, that fundam fundamentally we all want the same things, and it's a great platform to work from. So I think that's three things we can all individually do as a next step. Thank you for that, uh, Josie. Um, Brett, did you want to say something? Okay. Yeah, um, I think what you're talking about is, is an awakening. It's like a, a personal awakening. And um, if we really take the time to, to stop and reflect, I think what you're saying is we're, we're going to come to similar conclusions. So you were talking before about do we have the evidence and what, what is the next step towards um, sustainable cities? And I think intentional communities is, is 
very much the next step because I think as people start to stop and reflect and think a little bit about what it is that they really want, how it is that they really want to live, I think what we'll realise is that we've become a very um, individualistic society and we all have our own castle and put up our fence. But I think it's, on reflection, I think we'd agree that we'd really like to be more connected with the people around us. And I think, in, you know, be, the idea of an intentional community is that we intend to connect with the people around us. And there's, there's lots of different ways that you can make that possible. Um, so people need to, to awaken, in a sense, to that desire, and, and then we can make it happen. And I think that is, is really important. Then all of the frameworks and structures and, and principles can reflect that. Um, but all of the people involved really need to take that time. Thank, thank you, Brett. Look, but I, I just want to uh, um, just thank our, our panelists for their time and, and uh, sharing their passion and, and knowledge with us. Um, and also the Adelaide City Council Library for their space and support, which is uh, very valuable. As, as you know, the, the initiatives that they've got uh, in terms of Go Green is to really help to, to raise people's awareness of what's happening in the city. So this is great. And also I want to uh, show appreciation for um, uh, Miriam and, and Andrew Yip, who's been doing the recording uh, as part of their organization, Environmental and Science Media. So um, with that, I'd like to close and thank everyone for coming. <laughs>